Well, my heart really lies in the late 17th century Baroque styles. I knew for my first historically adequate project, I wanted to start in the 18th century. There's so much more information available out there to learn, and I already had a set of stays that were appropriate for the 1770s, so it seemed like the natural starting point. I started thinking about what I could do in the 1770s. I didn't really want to start with something serious because I knew this was going to be my first project and there would be some growing pains. I came upon the idea of doing a David Bowie cosplay pretty quick. He's a huge influence on me and there's this jumpsuit he wears that was designed by Kansai Yamamoto that is incredible. And the width of his pants in that jumpsuit beautifully reflect a gown over a pannier, so I didn't hesitate. But before I got started, I needed to make my kit. From there, I had to switch gears and start working on my Halloween costume. And in the meantime, I started teaching myself embroidery so I could do the pockets. Okay, here is the finished first pocket. I'm pretty happy with it. It took me way longer than I thought it would. So originally I just had the lightning bolts and when I was doing it, it felt really sparse and I didn't want to add more lightning bolts. And my mom said it kind of made it look Southwestern, which is kind of strange. It is the end of March. It is 8 p.m. After almost two whole months of waiting, I've finally gotten the boning to start on this pannier. Hey y'all, it's been a minute. Um, I came to the realization the other day that I did almost all of this off camera. <laughs> Whoops. Um, that's okay because you're gonna see almost all of it in the video when I actually do the dress. But let's talk about my mock-up and a couple of the things that I still need to fix. Y'all like my hair? I was taking photos today and uh, just decided to leave it up. Um, it's about five days after I filmed the last segment and all I wanna say <laughs> is I almost got cocky and just cut out the entire gown, but I didn't. I decided to baste everything together and put it on my body and see what was going on, and thank God I did. Hey y'all, Jackie here, and welcome to Fantastical Follies, where we finish year-long projects. It's done. After countless hours, stress, and money, I've finally finished this epic project. I'm not one to get emotional, but I have to be honest, at this moment, I'm pretty verklempt. Okay, that's enough of the sentimental bull jacks. Come on, it's time to party! Good night and party on! Party on, Wayne! Party on, Garth. Okay, all seriousness aside, y'all, oh my God, it's freaking done. Do I look excited? Because I'm freaking excited. This is the grand finale of my Glam Rock Goes Rococo project, where I'm turning myself into a 1770s Ziggy Stardust. In this video, I'm going to walk you all through all the finishing touches necessary to take my standard robe along glaze into a full-on, historically inspired David Bowie cosplay. We'll start by setting in the sleeves and then we'll add the sleeve puffs, all the trim, fix up my red petticoat, and then finally the reveal. This is the famous jumpsuit he wore designed by Kansai Yamamoto and the early 1770s English gown I used as inspiration for the whole thing. This has taken me so long to complete. It's entirely my fault because I wanted to do all the Bowie themed accessories and so I quadrupled my workload. If you haven't seen any of the other videos in this series, you can check out the entire playlist here or in the description below. It's been a wild journey and I don't regret any of it, but 
I'm so pleased to be finally sharing the finished product with you. I hope you all will stick with me till the end of the video where I'll reveal what my next project is and some other fun announcements. Like I mentioned in the content note in the description box below, there is audience participation in this video. I initiate a drinking game during the soutache portion. Make sure you have your beverage of choice handy. It can be alcoholic or non-alcoholic, as long as it's large, and be ready to drink when that portion begins. Future Jackie will put the timestamp here, or you can look for the soutache chapter. And because I'm extra, make sure you have a drinking game phrase to shout out every time I say the magic word. My phrase will be Frankenfurter, which will make more sense after you watch that portion, but you can yell whatever you want. And please leave me a comment and let me know what your phrase is. I would love to know. On that note, I'm not sure there's much else to say about this project that hasn't been said already. So let's get to finishing this gown and I'll check back with you after the reveal to share my final thoughts. First order of business, the sleeves. I cut my lining pieces out and gave myself a little extra seam allowance. You don't want to trust the muslin too much, so I'll do another fitting with these puppies to make sure I didn't screw up too much. Once that was done, I went ahead and cut out the sleeves of my actual fabric. I then diligently went and marked all my register marks on both the sleeves and the lining to avoid the sleeve pinning disaster of my mock-up. Notice I've surged all the edges of my lining to avoid fraying. Now, this is only one way of assembling sleeves for the 18th century. There are several. I'm pinning the lining to the sleeve with wrong sides together. To finish the bottom edge of the sleeve, I turned up both the lining and the sleeve by about 3 eighths of an inch and ironed and pinned. Then I hand stitched the edges together and basted the arm size both off camera. I folded the sleeves so the outside was inside. I pinned them together and ran them through my machine through all layers. Then I ironed open the seams and the sleeves were assembled. In prep for setting in the sleeves, I used my machine to run what I call a surging stitch all around my arm size. I don't know what the stitch is actually called, but this is the one I use because it looks a lot like the stitch you get on the serger. I'm not actually using the serger because I was too lazy to change the thread. Additionally, you could use a regular zigzag if your machine doesn't do this stitch. I matched all my register marks and pinned the sleeves to the arm size with the right sides together. Take your time with this. Don't rush it and you won't have to redo it. <laughs> Speaking from experience, any excess fabric in the sleeve head should get tucked or pleated toward the back of the gown. I did end up having to repin this on my dress form to get it to lay right. When I had this pinned on myself, I noticed that the lacing of the gown and my stays were showing beneath the tight pinned front. So I decided to add some lining to the loose front of the gown. I cut strips of scrap linen into a rectangle, surged one end that would remain loose, then turned under all the other sides and hand stitched them all down using a tunnel stitch so it wouldn't show on the outside. All right. Let's get this hemmed. On my body, I pulled up one side of the hem to get it to where I wanted. Then on the floor, I did a point by point hem match. This was annoying. I cut the majority of the excess off and then retried it on to make sure I did it right. Then I cut the hem down to about a half an inch. Because my dumbass pinned on the outside, I then flipped it over and ironed it down before stitching by hand. All right, folks, with that, the gown is hemmed. I have prick stitched the front lining, the loose front lining piece to the front, and I have sewn on the sleeves. I have done this per American Duchess's recommendations and used a very tight back stitch. Uh, they recommended using 12 to, I think it was 10 to 12 stitches per inch. I don't think I managed that. Um, this was a lot of fabric to get through. This is pretty thick, but I think it's pretty good. They did suggest also doing a prick stitch on the top here, and I may still, maybe if I decide just to make it pretty, but for the sake of time for right now, I'm not gonna worry about it. All that is left to do to have this assembled is the little sleeve ruffles and to take off all of these little thread bits. And now, time for puffs. I'm using the sleeve puff guide from the American Duchess 1760s Robe à la Française. I know this is an earlier time period, but the gown I'm basing this on has them, so I'm going for it. I cut out an outer and inner size ruffle. I'm not going to scallop these though. I did another serger stitch on the top of the ruffles. I used an iron to turn up the edges of both ruffles and hand stitched the hem. 
Then I grabbed my trim and pinned it onto the bottom of the puffs and hand stitched it down. I placed the larger and smaller puff together and turned in each on the wrong side. If you're doing these puffs, sew the trim on before you do this step, but <laughs> I was trying to get it all finished before the sun set. I sound like Ursula. I machine sewed those edges down. Now to get these babies to actually puff. First, I sewed a line of long machine stitches half an inch from the top. I then measured down what I think is an inch and a half and made marks and ran another line of basting stitches along those marks. To gather the puffs, grab both sets of stitches and pull. It's a good idea to tie off one side of these so the thread doesn't come out. I didn't do this on one side and totally regretted it. One tip, I always like to pull the bobbin side and not the thread side because it gathers much nicer. On my dress form, I pinned where I wanted the top to be and then pinned the puffs on and closed the side seam. I hand stitched it down to the sleeve. And with that, I have a completed English gown. Now let's take this thing up a notch and make it worthy of the star man himself. While the gown was on, I drew a line over the closure with chalk and then pinned the front together. I'm making one and a half inch parallel lines down the front of the gown. Easier said than done. From there, I marked one and a half inches up from each corner and drew lines inward following the pattern of the Yamamoto jumpsuit. So yesterday I drew all these lines on and then put it on to test out the, the design. This side is the side that has straight lines here and then it curves in like the David Bowie jumpsuit. This side has straight lines coming out and then straight lines, diagonal lines coming down. When I put it on, the straight lines just looked better and I did not, well, I did take photos of this and I sent them to my mom, but they were not very high quality photos, so I'm not going to share them with you. The straight lines looked much more intentional than the wavy lines. The wavy lines just look kind of haphazard and messy. So even though this is slightly different from the actual design, I'm going to stick with the straight lines because I think it just looks better. I also extended the straight lines and this has started to fade. Um, down to the arms, and I definitely think that looks good. So I'm gonna continue from here, doing an inch and a half and doing another straight line all the way around um, to the back of the sleeve. I'm also going to extend the lines to this back center seam. I am not going to put trim on this back portion because this is a focal point already. Um, so the design will stop here. I did, uh, based, hand based with red thread, the actual pin line of my gown when I'm wearing it. And this is a weird looking line y'all. Um, but in any case, I have this pinned because the chalk, obviously the chalk comes off and um, it's important that all of the lines meet. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pin that on there. Actually, I'm probably gonna pull this out straight, get these lines straight get the soutache done on this side, and then I'm gonna worry about getting it straight on this side. Um, again, the chalk comes off, and uh, it just seems kind of silly to draw it all on, spend all that time. Of course, it doesn't come off when I want it to come off, but um, when I don't want it to come off, it comes off. So in any case, I'm gonna do one side, and then once the one side is done, I will come back and do the other side, and then from there, I will deal with the skirt. I think I know what I wanna do with the skirt, but um, this is the most important part, so I'm gonna focus on that first. All right, onward. I was still unhappy with the way the petticoat was falling, and I had a lots of extra fabric, so I decided to make a bottom ruffle. Using the strip I cut off while hemming, I found the shortest length and cut the entire thing down to that size. Then I cut a strip the same amount from the petticoat itself, serged the top of the strips, sewed them together off camera because I was rushing, and then sewed them with a long basting stitch to the edge of the petticoat so that I can take it off for another costume if I want. I think it looks great, 100% the right decision to add the ruffle, but I can't decide if I should add trim to the ruffle or not. What do y'all think? I'm gonna show you how I sew on Sutash. Sutash 101. This is Sutash. This is Poly Sutash. Silk Sutash is like the cheap stuff, $5 a yard, and I'm 
probably gonna use about 60 to 80 yards of this on this gown, so uh, polyester it is. This is a huge roll that I got. It's 144 yards from Cheap Trims. Um, highly recommend them, though be aware you have to spend $65 to order anything. So uh, get with a friend to order in bulk or just have a lot of projects you need trim for. One thing about, where is it? What did I do with it? I see you shiver with anticipation. What did I do with that Sutash? One thing about Sutash to be aware of, it's braided. It frays like a mofo. I'll show you how I deal with that in a minute. I'm going to be using, this is just cheap Guterman cotton thread. I don't like this thread, but I have it. I need to use it for something. Waxed and doubled. So there's a little piece of tape on the end of here. Okay, that's what keeps the soutache from unraveling. I'm gonna fold that bit over. I'm gonna stick my needle in right at the edge here. Ouch. And stick that soutache down through it. And then I'm gonna use my spaced back stitch. And again, I mentioned this in my other video, but if you want me to do a quick tutorial on how to do a spaced back stitch, I would be happy to just let me know in the comments down below. Okay, before you get to the end, you're gonna take a little piece of tape and wrap it around the edge of the soutache a little bit further away from where you want the soutache to end. That's important, okay? So I want it to end here. I probably went a little too close on this one. That's okay. Then I'm gonna cut it in half, and then I have a little bit of tape on each end. And then I'm gonna bend it over. And then, so I'm just continuing to sew. And you know, it gets a little thick here, so the, the perfect spaced back stitch is not happening. I'm just gonna prick it. It's gonna get knotted. That's why I don't like this thread. It's too fine. Definitely want to use a thimble for this process. Okay, and then we'll just fasten it off. Boom. That is how you sew straight soutache. Once all the trim that must not be named was sewn on, I went ahead and sewed some frilly bits on the front like the extant example. There's one straight line of trim and then another line of big round scallops connecting it. We're getting so close to finishing y'all. I can almost taste it. I'm so anxious to get all of this done and show it to you, but first we have to cut out the organza for the sleeve ruffles that go inside the sleeve puffs. Now I'm going to try a new technique with this. I found it while doing research on how to cut squidgy fabrics out. I have five yards of very expensive silk charmeuse I'm going to be using to make a hibiscus robe from Mood's pattern collection later in the year. And if I like this technique, I'm going to use it for that. But I wanted to try it on something a little less precious before I do that. So I'm gonna try it on this silk organza and uh, I'll let you know if it works out. But uh, let's get down on the ground and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, as you can see, I have two of my three sleeve ruffles laid out here on this silk. This is the smallest one and the largest one. I'm trying to be as thrifty with this silk organza as possible. It wasn't expensive, but Dharma trading running out of this silk was the reason I ended up with the butt veil, so <laughs> it's precious to me. Um, and if you're wondering what the butt veil is, well, wait till cozy, you'll find out. Um, so what I've done here is laid it against the selvage. This is pinned exactly on the selvage here, okay? If you notice, this one has been cut on the line, but this one has an approximate half inch seam allowance on the paper here, okay? And if you'll notice, all the way around on the other bits, I have left extra paper, okay? So what the theory is, is that if you cut this in between two sheets of paper, it'll act like normal fabric and not be squidging around and give you wonky seams. What I have also done is taken the scraps from cutting out my pattern and taped them together. I'm going to place this underneath and this is doubled, obviously. I'm gonna place this underneath my area here. 
I'm gonna take a look and make sure that the entire pattern is covered by paper, okay? All right, and so what I'm gonna do now is pin everything down to the paper underneath this, pin it well, and then use my normal fabric scissors to cut out the shapes, cutting on the lines, not on the edge of the paper. Now, the person who put this together said, you can do this with your regular fabric scissors. It's not going to affect them that much. Um, my fabric scissors are kind of crapped out and I need to get a new pair, so I don't really care either way. Um, I wouldn't use this with your super expensive fabric shears, but um, it's probably not gonna dull them too much. I mean, how many sleeve ruffles do you really make, you know? So, here we go. Right. let's see how that looks. I didn't feel like the fabric was moving around too much except for on this right, this bit that I didn't pin down quite as well. Yeah, that's a pretty clean line if I do say so myself. Both pieces are even-ish. Let's look at the big one. Yeah, wow. Nothing's misshapen. I would say you're not precious about your scissors. That was definitely the way to go. Okay, I'm gonna go and get the third ruffle cut out. And I'll check back with you when it's time to do the hemming. Hem the raw circular edge on all sides. No need to worry about the straight tops. Now you could just roll this between your fingers and hem, but this fabric is so squidgy. And if I learned anything from the butt fail fiasco, it's to press up the first turn and then hand roll from there. I used a running stitch to hem it. Next, I pinned lace trim onto the bottom of each ruffle and again used a running stitch to secure it. The sleeve ruffles get assembled the same way as the puffs. You layer the three with the smallest on the bottom so the largest sits closest to the arm. I then basted them together and sewed them using some half inch double fold bias tape I found in my stash. Then I sewed it onto the edge of the sleeve using the sleeve puff as a position guide. This is meant to be removable so you don't have to be precious with your stitches. Now for the finishing touches. Using the reconstructing history pattern as a guide, I sewed on two pieces of bias tape on each side of the skirt back, a few inches down from the pocket slit and about 17 inches up from the hem. You'll then use these as ties to put the gown en retrousse. The last thing to do was add the tucker. Now traditionally this is sewn onto tape, like the sleeve ruffle, so you can remove it and add it to other gowns, but I have so much of this lace and time's getting short, so I decided to just sew it on. Make sure you only sew onto the lining and don't catch into the front of the bodice. This is it, y'all. We're getting close. We got 14 inches of trim left and this gown is finished. That finished line is getting mighty close. He also made me fast. I'm gonna run. All right, we're turning the shoulder curve. Almost there. Here we go. That was it, y'all. That was the last stitch. It's done. After a year and a month, it's finally finished. So I guess now all that's left to do is put this baby on and show you the reveal. I'll never get to be like David Bowie.
guess I dozed off there. Well, I guess I better practice or I'm never gonna get it right. One, two, ready, and. And there you have it. 1970s David Bowie in full 1770s fluff. I hope you all enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you've made it this far and enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing if you haven't. These small things go a huge way toward getting my weird little channel seen and helps the algorithm know what sort of content to recommend to you as well. This project was not without its hiccups. The stripes in the back aren't perfect, the back pleats are still messy, and with my pannier on it's hard to get the front closed without wrinkling. I'm thinking about putting some red bows at the back of the sleeves to hide the weird stripe junctions. Let me know in the comments if you think that's a good idea. Despite all the small issues, I'm so happy with the way it came out. I enjoyed taking two otherwise disparate things and smooshing them together until they worked. What do you think? Are there other eras you'd like to see me do a mashup of? Let me know in the comments below because I'm always looking for new fun ideas to try. Speaking of fun ideas, up next is going to be my Regency zombie project involving upcycling an old dress into Regency long stays, a multitasking zombie dress combo, and the bit I'm most excited about, a brain ridicule. I'm also pleased to announce that I'm going to be participating in the Costube Symposium this year at the end of August. I've linked to the Cozy Instagram account in the description below. You can follow that to get all the up-to-date information about the happenings. Please note that if you participated in years past, the handle has changed, so double check to make sure you're following the correct account. I'm super excited about Cozy. I'm finally going to be doing my video about the butt fail. I'll also be speaking on a panel about history bounding and I'm going to be hosting the red carpet gala event on Instagram. More details on those things will be given closer to the events. And as a note, the Instagram events are open to everyone. So start getting your best fancy ready for the red carpet. And if you're not following me on the old IG, I'm at Fantastical Follies Costuming, all one word. Thanks for spending your valuable time with me today. I appreciate each and every one of you who made it this far. And if you've been here through this whole journey, thank you so much for being here. It's been a whirlwind and I'm looking forward to the next new adventure. And with that long-winded spiel, I'm out. Catch y'all later. Ow. This bench is so squeaky. Ooh, ah. <laughs>